I knew what I was talking about. And years later, when Ron and I got close, he remembered this, and he said, he said, he said this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He's just talking to be talking. So, oh, and he was right. I actually remember that. I didn't realize I was just talking to be talking to myself. But Ron and I have become close, and uh, in the interest of time, I've really tried to hone this thing down. And then God told me, to share a prophetic word this morning. Mm -hmm. So my time starts after the word. Yes. Come on. So you know. yes. uh, Amen. I got this word in June or July, and I've shared it with, with some leaders, and, I've, and I'm going to share the word on distraction. Okay? And it was so prophetic, and it was so profound for people, but God says, today share it because it does relate to discipleship. Okay? Yeah. And so my wife, I went fishing. My wife is very, very observant. She can walk in the house and she knows everything that's been touched. Ten kids, if it's been moved an inch. And she watched a series called Sherlock Holmes. Not the movie, but a series. And his power was the power of observation. And so he would he could see like what's on your shoes and all this. So I, I said, I'll watch it with you. First movie, I've had to ask her. What what I don't understand. Yeah. If we have to rewind, she'd explain. And uh, there was one section where he worked with the police department and his brother was in the government. His brother said, I need you to help me because there's some rocket plans that have been stolen and the guy that stole them got killed and we need to solve this case. But th there's always a villain. So this villain had put together this plan. There was a serial killer and he would call Sherlock. He would catch somebody, strap a bomb around him and, and give Sherlock a case. And he's like 12 hours. You don't solve it, boom. And, and every time he solved it, immediately there would be another kidnapped person with a bomb strapped around him. Solve it, save, boom. And this went on for like six different cases. Well, it's all urgent and it's all important because they were going to die if he yeah. didn't solve it. Yeah. But he totally forgot about the other case until he got it solved. And there was a guy behind the serial killer, killer that hired him to do all this stuff. Took him just a few minutes to solve the other case. And he realized... All of this was a distraction mm. <laughs> to keep him from focusing on what was the most important. Yep. Now, I know urgent things come and important things come. Yep. But what the devil wants to do is to distract us. Yeah. Is he doesn't want us to be disciples and he doesn't want us to make disciples. Right. And so what I, it didn't stop the distractions in my life. In fact, they might have increased. <laughs> but at least I started recognizing them. Right. Amen. And realizing this might be a distraction. And a lot of them, when it got done, it, it amounted to nothing. But I spent hours and days fretting. So I want to encourage you, don't let the devil distract you yeah. from your purpose Amen. of being a disciple and making a disciple. Yeah. Now y'all can start my time. <laughs> it's a little intimidating. I, I, I don't speak to people that have so much Bible knowledge and, and stuff like that, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> I'm going to brutalize the scripture for you. Uh, <laughs> so my topic is on relationships. And in my life, I have had mentors in my life from day one. Two of them are in this room. Yeah. Mike McCarty, I've sat under his teachings. I've ate in his home. His whole family nursed me back to health after mm -hmm. a, in a hard season and, and a valuable mentor. And there's a lot of them. Ron and I have been closely connected, what do you think, 10 years? More? Yeah, more. Yeah, yeah. long time. <clears throat> but I've always had these relationships, and I've got a number of them. Prophets. Apostles, mm -hmm. pastors, teachers. Jim Newsom and I were close. He's a great Bible teacher. The reason I think that is because I was more high maintenance than, than most of the rest of y'all. <laughs> and I think Mike could amen that louder than anybody. Don't you think, Mike? I'll withhold. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what I want to focus on is relationships as, as it relates to making disciples. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'm going to give, when, when Ron gave me this word, I thought about 20 examples. I'm really going to focus on one that's happening right now, and, and because I, I got two brothers that are with me, and I won't give them five minutes apiece to, to reiterate kind of what I'm saying in relationship we've got together. So here we go. Uh, some years ago, God gave me a revelation on uh, being a disciple, and it came out of a wonderful verse that you all know. And I, I was up early one morning, and I'm not a morning person. How many of y'all are morning people? Raise your hands. God help y'all. How many of you are evening people? Okay, let me just tell you, you morning people think that if we just go to bed earlier, we'll get up and... Good morning. 
I don't know if it's a good morning. Don't tell me good morning. I don't know that several hours later. <laughs> it don't matter if I go to bed at five. I'm going to wake up crabby and grouchy. This was the morning I woke up crabby and grouchy. I was uh, up seeking first the kingdom because I took it literally. And I just opened my Bible. And this is what I read. Not everyone who call, says to me, Lord, Lord, will yeah. enter into the kingdom of heaven but only those who do the will of my father. Yeah. And I had just started Dallas Willard's book. Gary Henley had given it to me for Christmas. How many of you read The Divine Conspiracy? Mike's read it about 10 times. <clears throat> um, and it's a great book, but it's hard for me because he's a very smart man. But he was talking about the kingdom not being heaven, but being where God's will is done. Mm -hmm. And we pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I basically believe that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven is the definition of the kingdom. Come. It's where God rules, where he reigns, where his will is done. I had just read it. I didn't know if I believed it. But then I hear this verse. Many will come to me. Many. And say, well, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we heal the sick in your name? Didn't we do many miracles in your name? And he says, depart from me. I never knew you. You who practice wickedness. And it made me mad because I've been fighting a works theology all my, my, my life, you know, because yeah. I'm a condemnation yeah. person. Come on, come on. Come and on. so I got mad and I said, Lord, this sounds mean. I don't know what it means. I don't think it means what it sounds like. I threw the Bible down. And when it bounced, the Lord started speaking. <laughs> and this is what he said. Clint, don't look at it that way. Look at it this way. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into my rule and my reign in this life. Mm -hmm. But only those who do the will of my Father. Come on. Amen. And I'm like, okay, that sounds a little bit like Dallas Willard. <laughs> but then we went to the next verse. Many people will come to me in that day. And I said, well, what is that day if it's not the day of judgment? And he said, read down. So I skipped over one, read, a foolish man hears my words and does not do them. And he's like a man who builds his house on sand, and the winds and the rains come, come on, man. and the house yeah. falls, yeah. and great is the fall. Yeah. And I felt like I was being set up at this point. <laughs> <laughs> and then the Lord said, in the day, Clint, that the house you built comes crashing yeah. to the ground, you will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, how could you let this happen to me? Mm, yeah. And didn't I do cast out demons in your name? Check. At that time, thousands of them. Did I do healing in your name? Check. Happens a lot when you cast out demons. Isn't that right? Did I do mean wonders here? I don't know about that. But, but, but Jesus said, you built a house, but you didn't do it my way. You did it for me, but you didn't do it my way. Yeah. Now I'll tell you the truth. And then I read, a wise man hears my words and does them. Come on. And he's like a man that built his house on the rock. And the winds and the rains come and the house stands. Now, I, I came to understand in that process that there was more God gave me. And my job as a disciple is actually simply to learn how to hear from Jesus and do what he says. It's, it's basically that simple. I heard a... Uh, a message the other day it was, it was very timely I sent it to you Ron I'll let you listen to it but Chip the pastor of Pine Lake mm -hmm. preached it he was on discipleship I think he stole my book because he had some of my points but <laughs> I'll forgive him <laughs> he came up with a thing called L3 and, and it, it, it's learn from Jesus live in Jesus and lead people to Jesus Amen. and that's become my philosophy as far as my discipleship, but also in the process of making disciples, teaching people how to learn from Jesus, live in Jesus, and lead people to Jesus. So I add a T to it because once you do that, then you teach people how to learn from Jesus, how to live in Jesus, and how to lead people to Jesus. Curse me, you get no arm bowl. Mind breaking up? No, I, don't mind. I think it's holy. <laughs> All right. So, so um, Gary Henley taught me a scale on evangelism, and there's a scale called the Engel scale. You know, how many of y'all heard of the Engel scale? 
think John Wimber promoted it years ago, but Gary evangelized. You know Gary Henley? He was, yeah, yeah okay. Uh, Gary said, you know, everybody's on a scale. And maybe the middle of that scale is repentance and faith. Down at the bottom, means no knowledge of God whatsoever. Our job is not necessarily to take somebody from A to Z, but to move them up the scale. Yeah. So in relationships, I view it as, as I hope to move them somewhere up the scale, because ultimately, God does, Jesus does the disciple. Right. Yep. I'm trying to make somebody the disciple and encourage them to get to that point. So if I meet somebody that's here in the Lord, maybe I can influence another step up the scale. If I meet somebody here, and it may take years. Yep. Um, if you're in a relationship with me, you're going to know, and I say friendship, you're going to know I have a ministry in Ukraine. You're going to know I got 10 adopted kids. You're going to know God's stories. We're called to be witnesses. The only thing I know how to witness is what I've seen, yeah. how God helped me. You know I got a business. I got I had business problems. So I find it very easy in relationship to find things to talk about Amen. that are real, life, children, job, miracles. And you're going to hear my God stories too. And if we're in a relationship, you got to figure out, is this guy lying or not? And I, I'm not really in the habit of exaggerating or lying. So that's kind of, if we're in a relationship, that's what happens. The other thing I do is I connect people. If you're in a relationship with me, you're going to probably know Ron Gray. Yeah. Ron knows all my employees, most of them. He's my chaplain of the Stop and Supply. And uh, you're, going to, you're going to get connected to other believers in relationship with me. Mm -hmm. Now, real quickly, a story that happened. Most of my relationships flow around business, hunting, fishing, Come on. martial arts, mm -hmm. yeah. some church, <laughs> some church, <laughs> some church <laughs> but I don't have a job in a church. Uh -huh. Come on. I have no title, no job. My, my All the stuff in Ukraine, it's about relationships. But if you're related to me, it's gonna be usually one of these things. Now, some years <coughs> ago I was working out jujitsu with Dwayne. Dwayne will understand this. <clears throat> we had a fight school, and in the fight school, we just would get together and do judo, jiu-jitsu, kickboxing, boxing. And there was one guy that joined, and he was a judo guy, and he was an atheist. And he and I became friends. And I, I did this for like nine years with these guys. We came, became friends all together. We did, you know, fight nights, and we all brought the families and watched the UFCs. One night, he was talking to me, and he said, I want to talk to you. And I said, okay. He said, you're the only person in my life that I will talk about God with. My parents tried to shove it down. I had so many, I won't talk, I'll talk about it with you. I said, okay. Still professing atheist. I said, he said, you want to know why that is? And I said, sure. He said, no, no, seriously. You want to know why that is? Yes, Jim. I'd like to know why that is. <laughs> <laughs> he said, and this is, I want you to get this point, okay? He said, because I know that if I never become a Christian, mm -hmm. I never believe your God stories, you're going to still be my friend. Yeah, right. Come yeah, on. Exactly. And that is the philosophy I take into every relationship. Mm -hmm. My relationship, I want them to get saved. I want them to be. But it's not contingent on that. Yeah. So I de develop friends. Now, <clears throat> I've been going to Africa for 10 years. Started, I had, got a little hunt, and I wanted a safari club. I went, had a great time, and I began to connect with the staff. Peter Borland was the manager, and he and I got close. And uh, what happened over time, and I brought my kids, I brought some of my employees, I brought Brother Ron, and over time, I became like a chaplain mm -hmm. for this. Mm -hmm. And I have a book I wrote, I use it as an evangelistic tool, and uh, I have little videos I've done on YouTube, and I'll send those, mm -hmm. you know, my testimony, how to hear from God, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> and so, over time, relationships evolved into kind of a mentoring type situation. One of the guys' name was Philip. He was there 10 years ago. He is now the manager, and he has come and stayed with me for about two weeks, the last two years, when he comes to the States and promotes the hunting. I thought he was going to stay two or three days, but he stayed two weeks. And we had a great time. 
And we are close, close friends. He's from Zimbabwe originally, which is about an hour from where we are in South Africa. And this last time, um, my daughter Sophie made him go to church. He didn't want to, and Ron stayed in the man cave. It's dark. There's no windows. If you're sleeping, you don't know what time of day it is, and you ain't no hurry to get up. And it was raining that morning, and I didn't go to church. Um, and Sophie went and got him up, and he didn't really want to go. But he did because she felt like God warned him to. So he went. And I wasn't there, but he responded to the message, and he got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Come on. Powerfully. And uh, he and I spent the next three or four days because he's still trying to figure out what happened. Yeah. But God had just touched him so deeply, and he had a list of what he wanted God to do when he got back home. Yeah. And so we booked the trip. I didn't really have anything on the list, but I've, I've had a hard year. I've been really uptight. Everybody was happy to see me go. And, uh, <laughs> and I took my son Clark, who's 11, and it was like, it probably was the best vacation trip of my life. Amen. I was able to reset my soul, Amen. but I got involved in church. Philip goes and brings everybody together and says, we're having church in your room tonight. Clint, talk to them. And I didn't think I did a good job, but the next morning, they're like, will you pray for me? Will you pray for me? One of the guys I met on this trip was Philip's brother, Farai. I didn't know him. He said, you know, hey, I want you to pray for me tonight. I said, okay, so he came to the room after supper, and uh, we prayed just about his family, his wife's pregnant. She had a hard pregnancy the first time. And then we talked just for a couple hours in fellowship. And I sent him, we exchanged WhatsApps, and I sent him the, the big night that I did three years ago on the legacy of being a son. Saw him the next morning. He watched it three times that night. The night before we left, he says, I want to be adopted by God. Hallelujah. Like, you, like you're talking. Now, we're in continuous communication. But I had several of these events, and Philip knows everybody. And he's like, I'm not a good joke teller. Mike is great. Um, <laughs> never mind. I thought about the funniest joke I ever heard that Mike told me. It's so inappropriate. We can't do it here. But <laughs> <laughs> the funniest joke I ever heard in my life. Uh, <laughs> I distracted <laughs> myself. <laughs> It's a different mic. It's not the same mic. <laughs> <laughs> it was an old, a younger mic. It was what was I talking about? God? I don't know. Um, Preaching to the guy. Yeah, okay. So um, another guy there, his name is Pete. And he was a, he's a tracker. And I didn't know him. He was there last time. He was there when the judge was there. I didn't know him because he was a tracker. And, and so he, his job is if you're, if you're chasing buffalo, he tracks it. But if you shoot it, he tracks it. And then after you kill it, him and another guy skin it. And so he's really not involved much around the camp, but I'm the only one there at the ranch. I'm being treated like a king, and Clark's out hunting, and I don't like to even hunt in the morning, so Clark goes hunting with Philip or Farai, and then me and Pete go riding around and check hyena baits and all this. And, and, and he tells me all his stories and all this, and he's kind of a grump. He's got a hard life. He's poor. He's got a son that's blind and deaf. But, you know, he, he, he's asking me questions, but he's mostly telling me stuff. And then he just said one day, he said, look, I just want to tell you something. I've never met anybody like you before. I said, why? I haven't given him any money. He said, nobody ever talks to me. You listen, and I feel like I'm getting healed by telling you stuff. I said, well, praise God. That is part of the, the divine experience. So we're on WhatsApp, and we've got more intentional purposes now than we did before. So Philip knows everybody. So the joke was, Bubba knows everybody. And everybody knows Bubba. And the Pope comes to town one day, and he's standing next. So Bubba's standing next to the Pope, and everybody's going, "Who's that standing next to Bubba?" Right. We go to town. Everybody knows Philip. And I told Philip, I said, "Now that we're here, we're going to go to L3. You're going to start leading people to Christ." Amen. And so he's all for it. Um, I'm sure next time, he said, next time we're going to Zimbabwe, you're going to meet my whole family. Yeah. And so there's a lot of connections. One thing that also happens in relationships is they will connect you to their relationships. Exactly. And that's what's happening now. So that is mostly 
Uh, what I would, you guys come forward. Um, I probably left out something, but it's fine. Y'all get the point? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, brothers, five minutes each if you need them. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How y'all doing? Good. All right. Liars. <laughs> <laughs> that happened five or six times this morning, and where I want to go is you need guys in your life that can look in your eyes and get, call you a liar. Yeah. Yeah. When they ask you how you're doing. Mm, that's good. They can look in your eyes and if they can see something's wrong and call you out on it. Amen. There's three relationships in every one of our lives that we need. We need a son, yeah. we need a brother, and we need a father. Come on. Amen. In those three relationships, somebody you're discipling, you need a brother. Clint's my brother. We've only known each other. We've known each other for about 10 or 11 years now. We were introduced, but God has just joined us together about a year and a half ago. Yeah. And we're getting to the point where I can look in his eyes and tell that something's wrong. Yeah. Not quite there yet, but we're getting there. The point is relationships. The, um, the third one is the father. So you, you need somebody mentoring you. I truly believe and have lived this most of my adult life. If you don't have those three relationships in your life consistently, you're out of balance. Yep, yep. Yeah. Lastly, and the most important, which should be the first one, in what we've talked about over and over and over this weekend, is our relationship with Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. We need to be seeking him daily. Yeah. Yeah. We need to be seeking him every moment, every second of our lives. Yeah. We need to recognize that he is here right now yeah. at every moment whether you're in a Christian setting or whether you're in the grocery store or whether you're in Walmart it doesn't matter recognize that he's there right now Amen. and if we do that then we will be abiding mm -hmm. abide in him every day every minute mm -hmm. every second and John 3 30 says he must increase and I must decrease yeah. Amen. Amen. guys thanks for having me here this morning all right, man. Come on. Come on. Come on. Right, I'm going to quit, and I want to speak on my brother right here, Clint. Okay, this is how we got started, our relationship. I was in Walmart one morning against some worms, <laughs> and Clint walked in and said, where are you going fishing at? I said, I'm going to Houston. He said, well, you might be going fishing, but we do catching. I said, show sure up. He said, let me get your number. I said, okay, gave him a number. He said, my name's Clint. He said, well, my name's Clint. <laughs> he said, well, I will show you where you can do some catching instead of fishing. I said, okay. And he said, matter of fact, I got some um, fish on the back of my truck. I said, let's go. <laughs> so he gave me some fish off the back of his truck and got my number. So I never think, think nothing of it. About a week later, he said, hey, brother, what you doing? Nothing. He said, come on over here and um, fish with me. Sit down and talk with me. Two miles away from my house. <laughs> and it didn't take me two minutes. And I walked in there, and we fished, and we got together. And I said, okay, okay. And then it started getting better, you know. And we was building a relationship. Yeah. And then um, we got on down and fished. And next thing I know, he said, um, where, where, do, where do you work at? I said, no, well, right now I'm laid off of doing um, concrete. He said, all right. And then he started doing a little stuff for me, you know. Hey, do this for me, do this for me, you know. I said, okay, it's all right right here. And then we was working, but we were still been in a relationship now because we was, you know, learning each other. And then <laughs> he got so, you know, I know he was eating snow in there so he could see, let me see if he not trust me. And then when, when he got in his heart, he could build that trust. And I was like, hey, Clint, I'm finna get ready to go back on the road. He was like, Brother, I really don't want you to go, so I don't want you to leave me. Cause you so much help to me. But he thought I was a lot of help to him. But he was more help to me. Amen. Then, Amen. you know, because I was out there finding that concrete and you know, that 12, 13 hours. <laughs> and maybe a little bit more. Can't tell me what to do. And my job done when I get finished with that. And it don't be no 12, 13 hours. <laughs> and then another thing, and another thing. Hey, we started out relationship, just friends, and guess what? He my boss. He my spiritual brother. 
Hey, he got ten kids. Oh, I help him with them too. <laughs> no, man, we, we, we in it to win it. He not going away. And then I met spiritual friends and you know going on with that. Yeah. Everyone, we hunted together. We fished together. Hey, that's what it's all about. Because right. one thing about it, Amen. if you got the good Lord in it, it'll work. That's Come right. on. That's all I got. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys. So, so Chris, Chris is my food truck, but he, he just he works for me, and the food truck's part of it. He, 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 he's awesome. Darren manages my meat store, and, and that's kind of how we got into relationship is through business. I just want to sum up with one point. How many of y'all don't have a job in the church? In the, I'm not talking about the God's church. I'm talking about in the local. How many of you don't have a job? All right, guys. Your mission is out of the church. Yeah. Yeah. And it starts, I believe, with relationships. But we, we, before we were formed in eternity, God predestined us to good works. Yep. And I change that, that we have a destiny, but we have destinies. Yep. Every day, there's something God wants you to do. And it's not in the church building. It's in the business place, in the fellowship, in the gym, or whatever. Pay attention. Don't let yourself get distracted. God bless you. Thank you all. Such a unique guy. Yeah. <laughs> you guys go ahead and start praying. Big word. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else that you maybe have a word for Clint, feel free to come. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just love on him, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just refill him, God. Refresh his heart, God. Would you just pray for Clint? Right? Now, will you just... Is it okay? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, come on out, Jack. Thank you, Jesus. Brother Lord says yes. that he knows what's going on. Mm -hmm. He knows what's going on in your family. He knows that the Lord says, he just said it this morning, he said, you got a lot of brothers, but the Lord says, I got your back. Hallelujah. Come on. Yeah, he's got you. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank, Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your peace. Let's just 